My name is Johannes Henrich Schleifenbaum, um, complicated name even for German guys. Um, my function here in, uh, inside LMI is more being a, serving as a, as a consultant, as an advisor, uh, for getting the young talent people um, hopefully on the right track and bringing in not only my, my experience from additive manufacturing, but also from conventional production in the production industry um, to serve as LMI to those industries. Uh, I'm famous for <laughs> driving everybody crazy around me because everything is going too slow, it's not fast enough. Uh, there are so many ideas and get them on the market and I think uh, what I'm famous for is building network of ideas. And I started here with a, what was then back then called Diploma Thesis, so today it would be the Master Thesis. Uh, that was my very first point where I get in touch with powder and laser and the interaction and that weird stuff of forming parts layer-wise and that was really um, that was really, I, I got a rough feeling of how that could evolve um, and then I, I was so, so fascinated that I jumped on that train and uh, worked some well, five years or so on that topic and we introduced the first machine with a kilowatt laser system, what we called back then high power selective laser melting, although having in mind that the Trump just left the market and then we came up with, hey, let's do it in a more industrial way, in a more feasible way, in a more powerful way. If you are convinced in buying a machine, no matter what. I mean, the other machines are, well, are good as well. But what you have, from my experience, you start with that machine, you need to learn the process, you need to get to, you, you need to, get to know that ecosystem. And so in the very first shot, it's not that you have like 5,000 production hours on the very first machine from the very first year. You need to learn it. You need to see, okay, where can I use it at the first step, at the second step, at the third step. And this is, so to say, uh, the need for democratizing that, that whole story is that you need that low entrance barrier. You need to have a machine that runs for 300 hours a year and gives you some profit. To make some money out of that, to use that money, develop new things and by that you can also afford larger and more cost expensive machines which then after 10 years will run $5,000. That's all good, that's not the business case for LMI. Our business case is really to get into that market as fast as you can and make a profit out of it as fast as you can. Well, we are going for that. Um, if, you, if you look at a cost plate of a part, um, you easily come up with, uh, um, with the knowledge that if you go for high quantities, uh, material cost is basically everything that matters. Uh, and if you go for low quantities, it's basically the machine cost or the production rate per hour that matters. And we want to address that lower point and get into that market offering a machine at very low cost, um, which allows you to produce parts um, 300 hours a year, uh, and then it, you make profit out of it. That's our point. It's really dedicated one issue. I, I kind of jumped on that train, jumped off that train, and jumped on that train again. Um, but my basic idea back then, coming from the production history, said, okay, how can we really have a, 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 a carrier for the democratization of 3D printing? Uh, and metal, let's say in this case, because like you have the democratization of 3D printing. If you go to the uh, if you go to the supermarket, you can buy a printer for like less than thousand thousand bucks there. Uh, but how can we do that in metal printing then? And that's uh, when uh, those guys actually uh, had came up with that idea to transform that Faber style printing to metal parts. And that's where we get into discussion, hey, how could we industrialize that? Because if you go for the additive manufacturing industry, you see that, that the whole ecosystem is created there. Um, you have other design issues that you need to take care of. You have to take other machining principles that you need to take into consideration. But what's really missing now on that point is if you want to really get to start with it and play with it, it's, it's like you have to spend at least 500, 700,000 bucks and have that machine in-house, run it for like, I don't know, two years or so, and then you get eventually in the state of production. And if you compare that to conventional manufacturing, that's, that's quite another business. So what we thought of is, how could we now use that infrastructure that we have here in SMEs, especially in Germany, the tool makers and all those guys who are perfectly equipped with all that manufacturing equipment, but how could we get 3D printing and that whole ecosystem, that whole universe to that story, to that part of the story? And I think there's only one way to get them a, a, a possibility of having a printer which comes at lower cost and allowing them to run that machine for 200 hours a year and make profit out of that. And that was the basic idea to really, to really 
get to the democratization of metal 3D printing by offering a, a very low cost machine, which then allows them to get into that ecosystem, into the universe, which then will eventually end up in having also other printing machines and having the whole 3D data pipeline to feed that mach little machine and to get that on the manufacturing level. And that was actually the, the missing link, I think, um, that, that how to jump on that train, which I had by really, it was luck that I, that I get here, uh, to be honest. And how can we now be an incubator for the 3D printing industry and allow other people who maybe do not have that much luck in their lives before to get to 3D printing, to get to the part of the world and allowing that. So what stops company from uh, using Metal AM today? I think there are three cornerstones which we have to take care of. First of all, it's um, that you need to cope with unconventional, let's call it unconventional designs. You need to have the capability to use that um, uh, evolving or that natural design, let's keep it that way. I don't like the word bionic, sorry for being a bit longer, um, but in that sense to have more complex designs, uh, which are then fostered maybe by generative design. Um, then of course you have to need to take care about the the properties of the part because the, the material that are available today are not that wide in, in terms of um, just the number of materials and third of it is, is the production cost, um, especially at low quantities and low production uh, rates. Uh, well, actually, I think it's more down the road. The first thing we have to do is really to get it on a wider basis. We need lower machine costs, we need lower software costs, we need to get them an easy access to the whole ecosystem, the whole universe of having a free design, free production, free means not uh, at no cost, but at, at l as little effort as you can take. And once you get there, and once you get people taking care about this and, and thinking about this, hey, how could I improve this and how could I improve that? Then we're at the point where we need to use that, that generative design, um, where you also put in um, not, the, not the intelligence of the design itself, but um, in Germany, um, we have the fine distinguishing, in, in English it's only requirement sheet. In Germany it's Lastenheft and Pflichtenheft. Lastenheft means um, what should I fulfill with this product and the Pflichtenheft means how. Uh, and we should take more care about what should I fulfill and then generative design helps me how. But this fine distinction, even, it just starts when you're into that business. I think, at least this is my point of view, that it fits kind of perfect because what you need for democratization is to make it to have a low entrance barrier. And if I compare that to the whole Fusion 360 suit and that approach that you have it on the cloud and you do not, necess you do not necessarily need to, to buy all those software products, which kind of fits then to the low cost approach of the machine that you have the whole 3D data pipeline uh, going from the CAD from scratch to the machine uh, without interruptions and you do not necessarily have to buy the whole software suit that it's perfectly matched for us because if you want to buy a machine for 80,000 bucks or 90,000 bucks or whatever um, and you do not want to afford a software that's coming at the same price, well then that's, it. that's the point. Uh, in the end, I'm, I'm totally convinced that it will not only buy one machine, but more. Uh, but that's another point. I think if you think about uh, the whole Internet of Things, or what we in Germany call Industry 4.0, it's all, if you, if you boil it down, then what do you do in many of those domains that are coming around with that is that you um, switch from time-driven events, uh, from time-driven um, things to event-driven things. Um, keeping the, the, the example of predictive maintenance. You try to predict via the learning from your data when your machine is going to fail. And what you do then consequently is to decrease your warehouse, to decrease your spare parts, to decrease everything you have, to really, um, to really cut down costs as much as you can. But if that machine fails then eventually in the end, and it will fail somehow and somewhere, you need to be as much uh, reactive as you can be to produce those parts and additive manufacturing gives you the opportunities by just having the digital model to transform that into reality and I think our customers in 10 years will perfectly benefit from that approach that you do not have not necessary warehousing you do not have spare parts on stock you can cut it down to absolute minimum and just print the parts based on a digital model you can have production networks no longer um, that intensive logistics and the machine or LMI as, as a company will give you the key, the hardware key to enter that field. Well, um, actually, I, I 
do not have the magic glass ball, um, but what I can say is, and if we uh, look to um, examples from the past, and if you go for the sailing sh ships and the steamboats, none of them for the sailing ships would ever thought of being obsolete just by uh, seeing that one steamboat there. And if we derive that a bit more to the uh, current past, if you go for the hearing aid industry in the US, for instance, uh, they changed through additive manufacturing, and that's a proven fact, it's, it's not for me, um, you can read it out in the newspapers, uh, they changed to additive manufacturing and that hearing aid um, things within 500 days. And none of the companies that stick to metal in, uh, to injection molding, to plastic injection molding, uh, survived. So this is sort of, you need to get on the board right now um, to be up to date in 10 years. Uh, and this is, this is how it should be, and um, this is how you you should behave in this way.